Wednesday night, as I mentioned, I'm Paul Methodius here this morning to uh, start our uh, 13th program portion of, of the, uh, the Institute. Uh, and as you well know, uh, His Eminence has been a past president of the Atlantic College Holy Cross, and His Eminence continues to uh, and constantly shows his love and support of the school. Um, with, uh, without further ado, Your Eminence. Thank you. 
obviously Paul emphasizes the need to avoid strife and division in the church and concludes with some practical matters and lessons. It is clear that the letter of Titus has three main concerns. Church leadership, true verses, false teaching, and the church and church unity. And St. Paul deal, deals with these concerns by outlining first the profile of a true pastor, that is his qualifications. Second, the pastor's task of being a teacher who rightly proclaims the word of truth. And third, the pastor's task to be a leader and guardian of unity in the church. The first epistle to Timothy does not seem to be very different in content, although it is much more elaborate as it exhibits a richer content. After his opening address and reading, St. Paul turns to Timothy, whom he describes as his true child in the faith, and warns him about false teachers who stand in opposition to him and ultimately to Christ. Second, he focuses on church worship and church leadership in the parish, outlining the true intention of worship and the roles that men and women play in it, giving a general principle of true worship leadership, outlining the qualifications for bishops and deacons. Third, he deals with a particular theological topic those false teachers were distorting, the goodness of creation. Fourth, fourth he gives instruction to different groups in the parish, to Timothy, to widows, to elders, and to slaves. Fifth, he instructs Timothy how to deal with false teachers. Sixth, he comments on the rich in the parish who are to do good, to be rich in good deeds, liberal and generous, thus laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future. It's clear that the concerns of St. Paul are first for true teaching, focused on Christ's work for all. Second, true worship. Third, true leadership, assigning the proper place that everyone occupies in the church according to his charisma. These practical concerns match and strengthen the strength of those expressed in the Epistle to Titus. The second Epistle to Timothy starts with the usual opening address, readings, and thanksgiving. And then St. Paul outlines two main pastoral concerns. First, the pastor's need for rekindling the spiritual perspective for himself and for others, namely keeping the gospel at the center of his ministry. And second, the pastor's task of distinguishing true teaching from heresy by applying the right criteria. Before the closing lessons, the epistle also includes a personal plea by St. Paul to Timothy to visit him because of his grave situation, his suffering for the sake of the gospel, and for his impending martyrdom. Clearly, this epistle was written in order to summon Timothy to Rome, but it also provided the occasion for articulating more clearly some basic pastoral concerns which St. Paul had outlined in his earlier epistle. Reflecting on these contents, let me, let me to identify a basic three theme and three subcategories under which we can place almost all the points that St. Paul puts forward in these epistles. The basic theme is that of Christian integrity, and the three categories, the integrity of the Christian pastor, the integrity of the Christian faith, and the integrity of the church order. Put in other words, St. Paul outlines a threefold profile for clergy in the church, not only for clergy and leaders of the community of his day, but I would venture to say for the Orthodox priests serving in America in the year 2003. For St. Paul, the leaders of the communities are to be true pastors, teachers, and leaders. Let's examine this profile more closely by combining what he says in all three of us. Addressing Titus and Timothy, St. Paul, in fact, addresses bishops and priests of all ages. First, the true Christian pastor. Who is the true Christian pastor? The letter to Titus gives us his qualifications. First, our qualifications that apply to the person of the pastor, to what he should be. These include being, in St. Paul's words, Blameless, not arrogant, nor quick tempered or, or a drunkard or violent or greedy or hostile, but hostile. A lover of 
conclusive, master of himself, upright, holy, and self-controlled. Second from the qualifications which refer to a pastor's conduct in the church. A pastor needs, in St. Paul's words, to hold firm to the, to the sure word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and to convince those who contradict it. In other words, the pastor should be the upholder of the holy apostolic tradition. Clear then that there is a double form of pastoral integrity that, that is promulgated by St. Paul. Integrity of character and integrity of profession. A pastor cannot teach others to keep what he himself fails to keep. Likewise, a pastor should be professional in exercising his task of communicating and maintaining the Christian faith, lest it be carried away by self-appointed frauds. In the first epistle to Timothy, St. Paul presents the same pastoral integrity in a succinct way at the very start when he says to Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Based on his own personal experience, St. Paul believes that love, conscientiousness, and sincerity of faith are qualifications that a pastor acquires and maintains when he is fully attached to Christ and imitates him. Here is the key to a true pastor, his imitation of Christ, being christ -like. A true pastor is a person, St. Paul says, in whom Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience for an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. St. Paul believes that it is only when one struggles to be Christ-like that he can fight the good fight and avoid making shipwreck of his life as did Hymenaeus and Alexander, who St. Paul, quote, delivered to Satan that they may not that they may learn not to blaspheme. These are strong words, but alert one to the need for integrity in the life of the priest. The problem of those two individuals was that they were not conscientious in the ministry. In other words, they did not reflect Christ in their lives. A priesthood offered in our own times must be a priesthood reflecting Christ. Unfortunately, and much too often, more emphasis seems to be given to the messenger rather than the message. Too often our priesthood does not reflect Christ. In chapter 3, St. Paul gives further details about a pastor's personal qualifications, which are similar to those outlined in his letter to Titus. A bishop should be, he says, above reproach, temperate, sensible, dignified, hospitable, an apt teacher, not drunkard, nor violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and no lover of money. He must manage his own household. He should not be a recent convert who may be puffed up with conceit. And finally, he should be well thought of by outsiders. These are qualifications for bishops and presbyters which refer to the character and spiritual profile of the pastor. St. Paul also offers qualifications for deacons who are to hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. The second epistle to Timothy does not supply anything as specific on the qualifications of the true pastor, but rather fo focuses on how a pastor can retain his integrity. It offers a number of admonitions which reveal a pastor's true character. And first of all, St. Paul admonishes Timothy to, quote, rekindle the gift of God that is within him pastoral consecration, which he received through the laying on of the Apostle's hand. What is this gift? It is the, quote, spirit of power, love, and self-control. St. Paul says that it is the grace of Christ that enables every pastor to fulfill his holy calling. And what is this holy calling? St. Paul says it is to be, quote, a preacher and apostle. In other words, the pastor is called, one, to, pro to proclaim Christ as Savior, two, to administer the grace of Christ, and three, to teach the people about the riches that are in Christ so that they may grow into the fullness of his stature, his perfect humanity. And the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is in the apostle. 
in the Apostles' own words, is the grace which God gave us in Christ ages ago, but which he has now manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. There are several other admonitions that the Apostles puts forth in, these, in this epistle, which clearly clarify the pastoral task. Follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Jesus Christ. Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. Be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ that you have heard from me. Do not get yourself entangled in civilian pursuits since your aim is to satisfy the one who enlisted you. Do not dispute about words which does no good have nothing to do with stupid, senseless controversies. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but should be kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, forbearing, correct, forbearing correcting his opponents with gentleness. Throughout all these admonitions, there is one particular warning. There will come times of stress, which will come from people who are proud, he says, arrogant, abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderers, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, holding the form of religion, but denying the power of it. Suffering then and persecution for the priest and the bishop, like the apostle, need to be endured with faith, forbearance, love, and patience. St. Paul urges Timothy and priests of all ages to be steady, to endure suffering, to do the work of an evangelist, to fulfill your ministry. Second, the priest or the pastor as a true Christian teacher. There is considerable emphasis in these pastoral letters on the need of a priest to be a true teacher who teaches the sound doctrine. Chapter 2 of the Epistle of Titus is totally dedicated to this theme. We read, As for you, teach what befits sound doctrine. What is meant by sound doctrine? The doctrine envisioned here is practical and refers to the way Christians should conduct themselves in, their, in a particular situation. More specifically, the pastor needs to give specific instruction to old men, to old women, to young married women, young men, slaves, and masters. In other words, he has to discern the different needs that people have in their particular situations and offer them appropriate instruction. As a teacher, the pastor is urged in St. Paul's words to quote, show yourself a model of good deeds, to show integrity, gravity, and sound speech that cannot be censored. <coughs> so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say to us. St. Paul explains how a pastor can be such a teacher. He should always focus on, quote, the grace of God which appeared for the salvation of all men. It is by this grace that he calls and empowers Christians to renounce their religion and worldly passions in order to live sober, upright, and godly lives in the world, looking for the appearance of the glorified Christ and the consummation of their redemption. The immediate aim of this instruction is the right conduct and good deeds in the present life of the Christians, which St. Paul sketches in the third chapter of his letter. In the first epistle to Timothy, we see the duties of a priest defined in another manner. Here the priest is to be a teacher in a different sense. He has to refute false teachings and in St. Paul's words, whatever is contrary to sound doctrine, which is in accordance with the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which he has been instructed. The particular false te teaching that Timothy had to deal with was a rigorous and legalistic doctrine which, taught, which was taught by certain false teachers in the church and had to do with the denial of the goodness of he refers to those who quote, forbid marriage and enjoy abstinence from food which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for then it is consecrated by the word of God. 
consciences are seared. He characterizes them as conceited, as teachers who used and goodness as a means of gain. The task of the true teacher, in this case, was to expose the error and to show that quote, love of money is the root of all evils. Indeed, this task also involved, quote, charging the rich not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but to do good, to be rich in good deeds, so that they may take hold <coughs> of the life which is life and need. The second epistle to Timothy adds further points about true teaching in the church. It is the apostolic foundation that the true teacher relies upon and teaches. Timothy is instructed to hope and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also with that which he has heard from the apostle. And what is this that he has heard from the apostle? It is not only what he said, not only his teachings, but St. Paul explains, quote, also his conduct, his aim in life, his faith, his patience, his love, steadfast, steadfastness, even his persecutions and sufferings that he endured. Put succinctly, it is, quote, the godly life in Christ. It is this life that Scripture actually presents since in St. Paul's words, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the godly man may be complete, equipped for every good work. The clear message of this epistle as regards the teaching ministry of the pastor is that he should be he should not be theoretical but practical. For sound doctrine is not about abstract knowledge but about life experience. This is particularly obvious in the Apostle's repeated insistence that, that Timothy should, quote, avoid disputing about words which does no good but only ruins the hearers. Or, quote, to avoid godless gossip and chatter which leads to more ungodliness and eats its way throughout the community like gangrene. Or, quote, to have nothing to do with stupid, senseless controversies which bring quarrels, and that he should rather focus on how he can be approved by God as a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. There is one text in chapter 4 which sums up the apostle's view on the pastor's teaching. St. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of, Je and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and by his kingdom, preach the word, be urgent in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort, be in feeling and patience and in teaching. Summing up the teaching of the pastorals on the priest as a teacher, we conclude that he should preach the gospel which is focused on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He should expound the practical implications of the gospel in the life of the, of the Christians, using the scriptures as guide. He should avoid entangling himself in theoretical controversies and I was wrong. Third, the pastor as true Christian leader. The image of the priest as leader of the community in the pastoral epistles is linked with two notions, the notions of authority and the notion of unity. The pastor is the instrument of both. In his epistle to Titus, St. Paul sees the pastor, actually the bishop, as a person who upholds authority by virtue of his office. He tells Titus, this is why I left you in Greek, that you might amend what is defective and appoint presbyters in every town. A bishop in the diocese is, in St. Paul's words, God's steward, who holds firm to the sure word as taught, gives instruction in sound doctrine, and confuse those who contradict it. St. Paul stresses that the pastor is the leader endowed with authority and therefore does not yield for insubordinate or self-appointed leaders, especially before, before those who attempt to mislead the flock. Indeed, St. Paul gives him the right to sharply rebuke such people so that the flock will not be harmed. As a leader, he leads the Christian community in their conduct towards external rulers and authorities of human society and also in their 
and the unity of the Christian community be maintained. The entire first epistle to Timothy indicates how the bishop, and by extension the priest, is indeed the leader in the community who has in St. Paul's words a noble task charged to wage the good warfare. More specifically, the priest is he who specifies matters relating to the order of worship or in different functions and ministries of various groups in the church. He is to lead the old, the young, the widows, the, the slaves. Particularly interesting are the apostles' instructions and sympathy relating to the rich persons in the community. Such people have the possibility of leading others to good deeds which encourage everyone in the community and open up the true spirit of God's grace which is freely given and freely received. St. Paul says they are to do good, to be rich in good deeds, liberal and generous, thus laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life which is life indeed. It is the priest, however, who prompts and guides such people to do good deeds and inspire the entire community to contribute each in, in his or, or her way to the manifestation of the grace of God. For St. Paul says, it is God who furnishes us with everything to enjoy. The second epistle to Timothy enhances further the image of the pastor and his leader as it recalls the conduct of St. Paul in the church and all his labors. Timothy is urged to take charge of all aspects of the life of the community, to be untiring in the exercise of leadership, keeping in mind the example of the apostle all the grace of God that is freely and graciously given by Christ. As we have seen in the pastoral epistles, the virtues and qualities of the church's teachers are extensively discussed, suggesting what kind of pastor the church needs in every age. They envision a benevolent, holy, and, and inspirational leader who is recognized as the authority in the Christian community and respected by the community at large. Presbyter bishops appointed by Timothy and Titus were good, sound people, easy to get along with as resident pastors. I believe our priests in America need to be simultaneously pastoral and missionary. Pastoral in their insistence to remain faithful to our faith and its traditions as they serve the spiritual needs of the faithful entrusted to their care. Missionary as they share their pastoral message with non-Orthodox in this country, who thirst for the truth of our faith, allowing the Holy Spirit to transform them into the living expressions of God's love for the world. It is imperative for our church and, and her future to nurture a generation of priests that combine the virtues enumerated in the pastoral epistles with the missionary passion the apostolic church exemplified in the book of Acts. What I have done in this presentation was to affirm the basic insights of the pastoral epistles concerning the structures of the apostolic church, the importance of the appointed teachers to maintain the faith and the unity of the church in times of crisis. As we learn and are agreed by the pastoral epistles concerning our priesthood in this country, it is important to address our situation in America and to pray that the Holy Spirit heal the wounds and the fatigue that some of us are experiencing in our ministry, precisely because in, in St. Paul's words, we do not seem to rekindle the gift of God that is within us, which we receive through the laying on of hands of our ordained bishop. There is an increasing concern about spiritual fatigue, about family problems, the spiritual burnout that plague clergymen, not only in our church, but in many Christian communities in this country. This phenomenon needs to be addressed with honesty, with boldness and imagination for the future well-being of the church and her mission in this country. 
Lutheran church in Missouri City, one of the most conservative church bodies in America. 30% of Lutheran clergy truly love their work and serve as effective role models for others who might one day enter the ministry. Another 30% are deeply ambivalent about their ministry. They were positive about their ministry, but also identify systemic issues that led to expressions of what is described as a moderate level of despair. Another 20% are in what the study calls advanced state of burnout. That means that more than 1,000 Lutheran clergy are all in depression and despair, either unaware of or not trusting official channels of help. The remaining 20% are well on their way to burnout. The study concludes with a list of problems that they have identified as factors in explaining why this particular conservative church faces this crisis, which in my judgment is not only theirs, but perhaps ours as well. They include people beating on each other, mismatch of pastors and congregations, the difficulty of getting help to pastors, poor support for clergy wives and children, low clergy income, grossly unreasonable expectations of pastors, fighting and sick congregations, congregations where a few members dominate in the vast majority. Similar findings are supported, I'm sure, by other pertinent studies. I think you will agree that these studies reflect some of the problems and difficulties that our church is also facing in this country. Issues which plague the lives of our priests. However, it is not my intention to express a sense of despair about the mission of our church, nor do I desire to ignore the really admirable the agony of love and faith that most of our priests continue to offer in this country. To acknowledge the wounds and the fatigue and even the mistrust of some of our priests and, and what they are experiencing is a basic presupposition for the recognition that the mission of our church in America can only be carried out by God's grace. Furthermore, it is a call for all of us to find new ways to move beyond mistrust to support one another, to bear one another's burdens, to inspire and empower one another, to move together through prayer and love for one another towards the future which belongs to God. I submit the only way to accomplish this important task is to return to the pastoral epistles and to all of scripture, to pray for the inspiration and strength which can only come from the paraclete. The mission of God's church in America will be conducted in the context of an acknowledged crisis that leads not to despair, but to opportunities for growth, for healing, and for transformation, primarily by God's grace and our humble response to His calling and love. Orthodoxy's outreach in America will depend on whether her priests are imbued by St. Paul's admonitions contained in the pastoral epistles, on whether we are able to address today's pastoral realities with the sage of advice of St. Paul, whether we as men of prayer may transfigure the lives of those with whom we come into contact. It will depend greatly on whether tomorrow's priest will meet the expectations of the priesthood as enumerated in the pastoral epistles. Will he be a pastor whose priesthood reflects love, conscientiousness, and sincerity of faith? Will his personal life be above reproach, dignified? Will our priests be able through prayer to rekindle the gift of God which they received during their ordination? Will our life experience attract others to Orthodox? Will our priesthood prompt those whom we serve to deeds of faith? Will our lives inspire our parishioners to contribute to the manifestation of the grace of God? I am very confident that with God's grace,